The topic is Grow to Read, Read to Grow. Um, so welcome everybody. I think it's been a wonderful day and you've all heard so much about how important reading is and all the wonderful benefits of reading. So what we really wanted to do in this sen session is kind of synthesize a lot of that um, information and also get you talking to each other and talking to us. So it's, it's framed as a conversation and we would really like it to be a conversation. So what we'd like to do is um, we're going to uh, put up some questions and we'll answer them a little bit, but we also want to make sure that you're engaged so you're talking to each other, talking to us, and that we kind of wrap up the day by really having a full conversation about how to help our children at different ages and stages of development all the way through from infancy through adolescence. Um, so we'll get started. Okay, so I think today you've heard from every corner why reading is important, um, what are the benefits of reading. So what we'd like you to do is to turn to the person sitting next to you and from this formidable list here, just to chat with your person sitting next to you, what surprised you, what intrigued you, um, what is something key to you. So it could be anything. You have a higher income if you read. It could be it boosts memory or it helps with empathy. Any of these things, just turn to the person next to you and chat a little bit about why read. Can you all see the, the slide? I think it's a... So if you can turn to the person next to you and think about, well, what is it that's most important to you, right? When we say, why read? Because for example, this morning we talked a lot about attention spans and reading as a way to counterbalance distraction uh, and improve focus. So what are the things that you prioritize as a parent? Why read? Or why is it so important to you to get your kids to read? So if, if we want a little conversation here. So if you can turn to the person next to you, that would be great. Um, and just chat a little bit. Okay, you chat with the person next to you and then we'll share. So I think that, uh, it, that when we read, we get a better understanding of the world. And why we say this is because, uh, first of all, uh, it gives us a better reality. Uh, like how we were discussing in the previous panel that um, like even dark literature gives us a, a better reality of the world and along with that um, I think what we see inspires us to imagine more and I think using um, what we read we look at the world and we imagine more. That's great, that's excellent. I read, um, I read because I read because whatever issue I'm presented with, I can understand it better and relate to it better. And also I read, um, when I read, I get into a total, totally different world altogether. And sometimes that world helps me escape from life and I can just stay there for some time. And like, yeah, so yeah. That's great. Um, I think one of the reasons I read personally, those are great answers by the way, thank you for sharing, is, and I always tell my students this because I, I'm a teacher as well, um, is that it helps us understand what it means to be human. It helps us understand our own lives. Um, it's such a great way to understand all those moral ambiguities you were talking about and kind of think through the world we live in. So it, uh, you know, there's such tremendous depth to what reading can give, give us, right? Um, anyone else want to share before we move on to different stages? We have a student at the back. I love the fact that we're hearing from the kids. That's the most important thing, right? We want you all to love reading, so this is great. Uh -huh. Um, I think we should read because it kind of distracts us from like the sadness of the world around us. Like sometimes, like for example, when I had a really bad day, if I take a book and read it and like it's, if it's a funny book, I kind of like feel better for the rest of the day. That's great. That's brilliant. That's absolutely wonderful. And when I ask my students this question you know, without the answers, they say, well, we know why you read, Miss Nadine. It's because you're a librarian. You have to read. <laughs> you're paid to read. So we're going to start right from the beginning, right? Because reading, a, nurturing a reading life and building a, you know, building a reading environment, a raising a reader, this starts right from infancy. So um, one of the things we're looking at is when to start and how to read uh, to young kids. 
right? Uh, would you like to put up your hand if you have a child not yet at preschool, so a very young child? Are there any parents sure. in the room with infants? In, any preschool infants? kids, below preschool? Below preschool, babies in arms, pregnant women. <laughs> 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 literally can start that early. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things, I, since we don't have a whole lot of people in that demographic, we can kind of move through it quickly. But the idea is to start young, start early. It's never too young. Um, and reading aloud, of course, is the first introduction a child gets to books. So um, reading aloud and placing books physically where children, even toddlers, can get at them. So that idea of access for preschoolers and infants um, when you create a physical reading culture where books are accessible um, and books are visible and you're reading books and talking to kids, telling kids stories, it really starts right from infancy. It's never too young, right? Uh, anyone with kindergarten children? Yes, yes, okay. Okay. Um, so, when to start, I think we've already covered that. Um, what to do? Um, I said to Maya, actually, we can cut this short, you can all go home. Um, there's only two things you need to do. You need to be a reader, and you need to read to your child. So, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things. I want to tell a little story, actually, in terms of what to avoid. So, I have a son who's, who's now much older, but when he was about five, um, all the other kids in his class were reading, so they were able to um, decipher the words, uh, they'd crack the code, and they could read independently. And I was starting to get anxious as a parent because that's, you know, parental anxiety, it's like an illness. Um, we all get anxious. Other kids are doing this, your kid's not. Um, so I started to really push, you know, reading with him and, and reading with him every day. And then I read alouds because I used to read aloud to him every night. When I would read aloud because I was anxious, I'd suddenly start saying, and what's this word? You've seen it before? And can you spell out this word, you know, whatever it is? And he just, he, you know, he said, Mama, I don't want to read aloud anymore. And that just broke my heart because he loved reading aloud. It was such a pleasurable time of day for him and for me. And I realized that by suddenly mixing up this learning to read with the pleasure of reading, I was ruining the pleasure of reading for him. And so I backed off a lot. I said, you, look, we will work on phonics and whatever school is telling you to work on but we'll do that separately. Read aloud time is just for pleasure. I'm just going to make it as enjoyable as I can because my long-term goal is that you love reading. And I know as a teacher, I've worked with high school kids for well over a decade. I've never had a student who's unable to decipher the code and read, but I have a lot of students who don't love reading. So when you're thinking long-term and you're thinking about what you really want for your kid, the most important thing is to nurture that love of reading. So I think at this age, making sure that you have a pleasurable, pressure-free time to read aloud with them so that they really, really love books and you're, you're hooking them in, right? You're cuddling up with them, hooking them in, and then you're building a reader for life. Um, that, I think, is the most important. So, How many of you um, speak another language at home, either you or your partner? Okay. So one thing I'd really plead, plead, beg and plead you to do is to read in your mother or father tongue with your child and to keep doing that. So in our household, my husband's Dutch and he has a very important role of reading aloud and reading with my children in Dutch and to expose them to Dutch literature. So please don't sacrifice your mother or father tongue to the altar of English because <laughs> that's what a lot of people do. And it's just so sad because you lose a part of yourself when you give up your language. How many parents here have kids in lower primary? We probably have a lot of you with that grade one, two, three. Yeah? Okay, great. So that's a wonderful time, right? Because kids are actually starting to begin to read independently. And you're starting to make this very slow transition from learning to read to reading to learn, right? Um, and so it's, it's quite an exciting time, but you might find that kids are at very different levels in grades one and two. Um, and boys, research suggests, tend to lag behind girls a little bit in terms of the speed with which they learn to read. Um, so 
as a parent, I think realizing that every child learns to read at his or her own pace uh, and kind of not getting too anxious, not putting too much pressure on kids um, and, and kind of getting them to that place where they are ready to make the transition between learning to read, that means actually deciphering the letters and the words, to reading to learn, right? Where they're reading books for pleasure, for knowledge, for information on their own. And they're also slowly, by grade three, starting to transition into chapter books. So you want to be moving them along at the pace they're ready for, right? Different kids, uh, one of the things I've realized as a teacher is just as much as you have a variation in height in a classroom, you have the same variation in cognitive abilities and different uh, readiness uh, and the rate at which kids develop. Uh, and so as a parent, don't compare your kids, just realize that each child is on their own journey and kind of meet them where they are and help them from there. Right? So that's, that's, I think, very important at this stage when you see those variations in kids. And young children are acutely aware. So a lot of schools go out of their way to pretend you're the crocodile level and you're the monkey level and you're the <laughs> whatever level. But every child I've ever known has always known exactly where they are on that hierarchy. Um, nobody has to say anything. They know where they are. They also know when they are struggling. And so to be compassionate if your child is not the hare, but rather the tortoise, and to find really nice, fun ways so that they don't give up on themselves. I think the worst thing a child can ever do is give up on themselves and brand themselves as a non-reader. Um, <clears throat> There's no shame in being dyslexic. There's no shame in having a learning problem. The shame is if you find it shameful and don't do something about it. So that for at least probably 10% of kids at school, there will be an issue. Um, Either aid, my son's got ADHD, he knows it, I know it, the school knows it, everybody knows it. We don't, it's not a shameful thing, it's something he has to cope with, it's something we have taught him to advocate himself for. Um, it's something he has to know how to manage his issues. We have children who are dyslexic in our school, there's no shame in being dyslexic. It's just something that you need to cope with. And the earlier you know that there's an issue, and the earlier you have it diagnosed, the earlier you can get support, and the more that can be done. So I know in some cultures it's almost taboo to mention that there might be a learning issue with a child. Um, these days, we know so much more than we've ever known before. And generally, I'd say if a child isn't reading kind of middle somewhere, by grade three level, something's going on. Um, and it's time to really think about what you could be doing to help them. In fact, a lot of the research suggests that actually you can predict learning outcomes in high school by how the child is reading in grade three. So grade three is seen as a sort of watershed year because um, by grade three, if a child has not made that transition to reading independently, and being able to understand what they're reading, um, then they're going to fall further and further behind because the expectation is at that point they've made that transition to um, read to learn. So definitely I think by the end of grade two, if you're noticing any issues with your child's reading life and the child hasn't made that transition, um, then it's time to get support. And, and kids will, like I said, as a high school teacher who's taught thousands of kids around the world, high school kids, you know, come in knowing how to read, uh, no matter what the issue is. Even my dyslexic students um, know how to read, right? Um, so, so the issue is just making sure that you intervene at the right time so that they don't start falling behind in other subjects across the board. So by the end of grade two, I would say, um, if the child hasn't made that leap, that's the time to make sure that you are um, intervening, really having conversations with teachers, and thinking very deliberately about how to help that child make that leap. There's one more thing I want to say, though, here. Um, uh, about lower primary, all the way through primary school, um, I think parents should continue to read aloud to their kids. So there's research that shows that a child's listening age, or what a child can comprehend when they listen, is far ahead of their actual reading age. 
So your student or your child may not be able to um, understand Charlotte's Web when she reads it on her own, but she will be able to understand it when you read it out loud to her in second grade, perhaps, right? So making sure that you read out loud to them, even when they are making that, trend, you know, that leap into reading independently and continuing through primary school or a junior school, uh, I think that's really important. And it's a great bonding opportunity it's a great opportunity to talk about books and talk about reading and stories and characters, themes. So continuing to read aloud all through primary school and beyond if your child wants that, right? And also, also the cultural part. Um, my husband still reads with my 14-year-old son because when he's reading Dutch literature, because he didn't grow up in the Netherlands, even though he is Dutch, we've been living abroad ever since he was born, he doesn't understand it. He understands all the words, words, but he has no context. He doesn't know what it's like to grow up in that area. So reading around aloud or together, you can kind of fill in the gaps, also contextual gaps. You know, <laughs> our children, um, we are ancient history for our children. So even books written in the 80s, when you're talking about cassettes and Walkman and typewriters, they have no idea. And you can only catch that if you're reading with them and reading aloud to them. Yeah, so you can deepen the reading experience so much by reading aloud and continuing to do that even after your children can read independently. So I think that's really important. One more thing, actually, I found some very interesting research as a you know, I teach or I have taught high school, um, grades 11 and 12, and I'm always worried about my students' writing skills. And there's research that shows that reading aloud helps kids develop a sense of grammar because you're pausing at the right places um, and the way you're reading the sentence is giving them some understanding of the mechanics of language. So it's actually quite important, um, even from a writing perspective, for them to hear a language and hear books being read aloud. So continue to do that all through, um, definitely all through primary school. Okay. Many parents have children reading above their chronological age. Does, do any of you have that issue? So you have a grade two and they're reading at a grade five level or, yeah, that's quite a common thing. Um, so people ask, you know, what to do because if they get into middle grade and young adult literature, it all gets very gritty and um, you don't want them to read about sex and all the rest of the things. Um, so a couple of things that help. Uh, one of the things is fantasy. Fantasy is wonderful for advanced readers because it really occupies the imagination. Um, more classical, older literature also helps. Um, the other thing is, I would say, they just don't get it if they can't get it. So they'll just read over. They won't even know what on earth is going on very often. So sometimes they'll just read something and you'll go back and you'll say, oh, and how about that or that? And they're like, what are you talking about? You know, they just didn't read it. The other thing is, which I always use as a defense to parents, is would you rather have them read about it or be doing it? <laughs> so, um, one of the books I have in my primary library is a graphic novel called Tomboy, and it's a gender identity um, book. And a mother came in and she was, my daughter was reading this, and you know, the questions she's asking me. And I'm saying, thank heavens, because she's now 12, and you still have a relationship with her, and she's still asking you these questions. If she reads this exact same book a year or two later, she will not be talking to you about this. She'll be having all these questions, and she won't ask you, and you won't have this discussion. Isn't it wonderful that she's reading this at an age where you still have that type of relationship, and you can talk about these things together? Do we have parents here with upper primary kids, so sort of grades four and five, right? Very exciting time as a reader, I think, because they're able to read so much more now, and most kids at this point are definitely reading independently. Um, I think uh, a couple of things. One is to really encourage 
peer reading circles and a peer culture around reading at this age because kids love talking about their books. And if the recommendation comes from another student, another child, they're going to be much more excited than if it comes from a parent or even a teacher. So getting kids connected with other kids, book clubs, book conversations. I mean, this is a time when reading can become very social. Um, kids like to act out books. Uh, you know, so much social activity around books. So you really want to encourage that, I think. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how to challenge them? Or... So we have some interesting questions. How many of you have, with kids that age, have your, feel like your kids are stuck because they only read low-level literature? They're reading Geronimo Stilton's Magic Treehouse series, and they're just wimpy kid, big Nate, and they're not moving beyond that. And you're saying, come on, this isn't real reading. Anybody have that issue? Because I certainly had it with my son, right? Big Nate, big Nate, no! <laughs> so, yeah. But, um, so one of the things, you know, that we've talked about as, as teachers, as librarians, as people who work with kids, how do you, you know, what do you do in those situations? If the child is kind of stuck at a reading level and you feel like you want them to move along the reading spectrum, but they're not doing it on their own, how do you intervene? To what level do you intervene? So, and I, I think this is, there's no right answer. Everybody disagrees usually. Um, so maybe what we can do actually is open it up to all of you. Can you turn to the person next to you, talk about what you think is the right thing to do? Do you ban the books that you don't like and force them to read something else? Do you um, try to find other ways to get them reading other things and moving beyond these books that you feel they're getting stuck in? What do you do? What would be the right thing to do? And then we can kind of have a conversation as a group. So can you turn to the person next to you? Imagine a scenario, your child is stuck at a particular level with particular books. What do you do? I think I would probably keep interesting books lying around. Mm. I mean, there are many books that have fascinating um, cover pages. Right. Uh, at home, I have to stop my first standard kid from reading my books right. because they've got some very interesting titles to it. Um, so I think that would be a suggestion, and maybe why not a joint read aloud? Yes, I, I think the joint read aloud is a fabulous suggestion because it is one way to make sure that your child is reading something challenging and not just being stuck, right? Um, do you want to jump? Uh, in? Yeah, one of the things we do in our school is in Singapore we have something called the Red Dot Awards. So we choose eight books for, for each level of reader. And for the lower and upper elementary and um, young adults, we have a competition every year called the Reader's Cup. And students get into teams of six, and they have to read those eight books and then compete against each other. And the fabulous thing about that is it gets them reading books they wouldn't usually read. There's a competitive effort. And some of my students will read the same book 10 or 12 times. And I'm not telling them to do that. They're doing it on their own, and their peers are pressurizing them into doing that. So it gives that close reading, that reading depth that they wouldn't otherwise get. And it's not a novel study. It's not a teacher telling them to do anything. It's because they want to, and they want to win. <laughs> Yeah, so I think if there are ways to make it a social, um, social, socially interactive kind of uh, reading journey, that's exciting. Uh, personally, for me, with my own children, when my son did get stuck, for example, um, I didn't ban books. I don't really believe in censoring books, uh, you know, unless I, like there's something very inappropriate in the book. Um, so I didn't, I didn't say, no, you can't read it. I said, I won't buy it for you. Um, so those are books that if you're going to get, you have to borrow from your friends or something because I'm not going to buy them. But I would try to leave interesting books lying around, book talk them, so kind of share a book and say, look at this book, it's a great book, it's really interesting. Sometimes read the first chapter with him and then let him read the rest on his own, kind of get him hooked so that he reads the rest on his own. But I would very deliberately try to make sure that I was moving him beyond that kind of candy, low-level reading so that he was challenging himself and growing as a reader, um, you know, in different ways. So I think as a parent, you know, there's no right answer, but it is something to think about. How are you going to recognize that a child is stuck and kind of move them along so that they're growing as readers? And the alternative isn't Geronimo Stilton or Jane Austen. 
or Wimpy Kid or Dickens. There is so much happening in children's books and young adult books, really exciting stuff. So educate yourselves, please, and make sure you know what's trendy, what they're enjoying, so that you can make that accessible as well. Yeah, because I have parents in Singapore all the time who will do this. They'll come and say to me, my child's not reading Dickens. I say, why do you want your child to read Dickens? Get your child excited about reading. Read good YA literature, right? Um, read some of the authors we have here. Read Paruana and the Ranjit Lal. Read good children's literature to start with. Um, one thing also is to know your child's interests. If you know your child loves sports, sports biographies might be a great pick. But getting to know your child as a reader, thinking about what you can you know, give them that will excite them. I just want to ask one question. The problem with my son is he's not moving towards the upper level because there are certain words which he doesn't understand. He doesn't want to go through the dictionary. Because and he, the words keep coming and coming and he doesn't understand them. So he just stops reading it. So what should I do? He doesn't want to open the Google. He doesn't want to do the effort to find out the meaning. When you don't know the meaning, you don't want to read it anymore. I don't want to do that either. I mean, <laughs> who wants to do that? Let's be honest. We don't want to look in the dictionary. Um, there are a couple of things. Of course, you can read it with them. You can read aloud to them. And I'd say that is your job. That's one of your most important jobs, not taking them to tutoring, not making them do their Kumon worksheets, but reading with them. Um, the other thing is that's where e-readers do become very valuable is because they can then just push down on the word and the definition will pop up for them. So, um, yeah, there's no easy answer to that. Audiobooks are another wonderful way because it does help with pronunciation um, of, of foreign words, difficult words. So I, I really always recommend audiobooks. Yeah, e-readers. In that case, an yeah, e-book e might be the solution, um, definitely. And just, you know, the more he reads, the more vocabulary, vocabulary he'll develop. But if he doesn't read, then it'll go downhill, right? So maybe e-books, audio books, read alouds, all different ways to bridge that gap and get him reading. I just want to suggest that read the dictionary. It's one of the most interesting books you'll ever find. <laughs> I'm with you. I love words. So yeah. the, you know, the life but, of each word is so interesting. Don't go from A to Z. Go from A to the middle, back to A, then to Z, and have fun with it. Yeah. It's the best thing in the world. I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to move very quickly on to middle and high school, secondary school. Um, and interestingly, the research shows that this is a time when there's usually a big dip in reading. Kids are becoming very social. Um, their social lives are becoming, you know, matter so much more to them. Often this is when they start Facebook, Instagram, you know, you're having those conversations and arguments. I want social media. No, you don't. Um, that kind of thing. So it's a time when, as a parent, I think you have to be quite deliberate about how to make sure you're moving, you're keeping the reading momentum going. Because research suggests that there's a significant dip in middle school. Um, and so, you know, so sort of grade seven, eight, nine, um, kids who've been reading all along suddenly don't read as much. There's a lot of competition from technology, peers, so many other things. So as a parent, thinking about how to preserve time for reading no tech zones where you kind of, you know, shut out the competition for a little while so they keep reading um, and continuing to have conversations about books, getting them books, all of that becomes very, very important in middle to high school. I also wanted to plug picture books, picture books for older students. Um, you are never too old to read picture books. And, you know, if they will read nothing else, sometimes I will just put on the dining table next to my son's dinner plate, a picture book for older students that I've really thought has been very meaningful or um, something that challenges thinking. Um, there are wonderful lists of picture books for older students. Um, we've both um, put a, some books out of books we particularly enjoy as well here. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up very quickly, but one of the things we want parents to think about is the idea of building a reading culture or reading ecosystem. Um, so how do you, as a parent, think about the physical environment, right? There's research that shows the number of books in your house um, up to a certain point at least correlates with how much kids read. You want 
books around, and in this case, physical books are, are I think, more valuable because kids will browse them, pick them up, read them. So your physical culture, your verbal culture, what kinds of conversations are you having about books? Maybe you're just going around the table at dinner uh, or in the car, uh, talking about what you're reading. Everybody's talking about what they're reading. Um, it's a good way to get the parents reading too. If you know you're going to have these conversations, then you have to read. Um, so the verbal culture and then the action culture, are you taking them to plays? Are you bringing them to lit fests and libraries? Um, are you getting them, you know, are you helping to in every way send the message that your home is a reading home and that you love reading, right? Uh, and Maya and I, when we were um, together in Singapore, we were part of a book club and my daughter, who's 15 now, she was dying to join our book club because she just saw this as something so cool that, you know, these parents are getting together and they're reading books and they're talking about books. And um, so join a book club, make a book club, create a book club, encourage your students to initiate a book club on their own. All you need is, I'd say six is the optimal number, six people coming together. Mm -hmm. You don't all have to read the same book. You can just say, we're going to meet once a month and we're all going to bring a book we love and we're going to swap books amongst each other. It's simple. You don't, you don't have to make it a very complicated thing. Um, we'd like to just open it up for questions before we wrap up as we're, you're thinking about you know, getting your kids all the way from infancy into high school. Um, and of course, in high school, they're transitioning to adult literature. Um, and that, that transition, I think, as a teacher has been really interesting for me as well. Um, so any questions about that whole spectrum of, of uh, ages and stages and reading to grow, growing to read? Or comments, suggestions for other parents? I'm sure you all have lots of great ideas as well. Any children want to tell their parents what to do or not, what not to do? <laughs> Uh, so I had a question about what you mentioned earlier. Uh, you said that some books are inappropriate for younger readers. But while referring to la the previous panel, you said that like, the students should decide what books you want to read, that's actually quoted, and that the parents should not play a very large role influencing or regulating what the, the child reads. And so those two points are like, directly contradicting. So yeah. I just want your opinion on, on my question. And I, I think for high school, I would definitely go with what you said at the end, that kids need to figure things out on their own. And parents can be very overprotective. I know as a teacher, I have to be quite careful sometimes about books I recommend because parents can get upset. But I, I think when kids are very young, you know, books with graphic sex or violence, you really don't want them to be reading in primary school. I just, you know, they're probably not going to understand it anyways, so it might just go over their heads. But why expose them to that? And most children's literature and YA literature wouldn't have that anyways. But just, I, I think being a little careful about uh, when they're young, uh, and you know your kids as well, um, but when they're young, being you know, a little careful about what they're exposed to. And then as they grow older, they're, they're going to be um, learning about the world. They have to face death and dying and, and all kinds of the cruelty of the world. And that's part of you know, that, that growing up process. So they'll get that from books as they grow older. But when they're young, you, know, you don't want kids to have nightmares. I mean, my little daughter once read a book um, about tsunamis and, and catastrophes and had nightmares for a long time. You don't want that to happen, right? Um, so why provoke anxiety in very young children when they're not ready for it? So developmentally, you kind of have to understand your child, and if it's, a, if it's not appropriate, it's not appropriate, is my, my thinking. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Feel thank free you all. to come and have a look at the books on display. We've We've had a lot of parents ask us for resources. So we have right now um, a selection of quite new books um, that Nadine has curated uh, here. And we have a bunch of resources also in terms of websites up there. So if people want to take pictures or look at them, uh, just in, you know, since we've had lots of people ask us for recommendations, here are some contemporary new books that you might not have heard of but are worth reading. Thank you, Nadine, and uh, thank you, Maya.